So we'll try and keep some time for questions at the end, but if we don't get through all of them, we'll get back through Tech Trust and we'll answer those questions, make sure you get those answers. So I'm Kate from Super Highways and this is my colleague Colin. Hello. Um, so we've been asked um, to talk about cloud migration, pitfalls and lessons. And hopefully you will have seen from the session outline that we're going to focus on Office 365. So hopefully everybody in the room has got an interest in cloud and specifically Office 365. Um, so this is just a little bit about us for those of you that don't know us. We're based in London. We work with very small local charities and community groups. We've been around for 20 years. We've got quite a breadth of projects and services. We do some digital inclusion programs. We develop websites. We do tech support. Um, and what we've kind of built into this afternoon's session is some practical advice um, on making the move to Office 365 as smoothly as possible. We've put quite a lot of information in the slides because some of the slides should act as a bit of a checklist for you if you're, if you're embarking on this journey. Um, and obviously you'll get, get these shared to you afterwards. And there's lots of links that are clickable so you'll be able to click through to further information. So that's, that's the way we've kind of designed it. So the, the slide deck will be a useful resource afterwards. Not just death by PowerPoint. No. <laughs> um, first, it would be interesting just to see in the room, can I have a show of hands for charities under a million income? Okay, so most of you, and that's really our, our client um, group that we focus on, and, and actually many, many, many much smaller than that, so under 500 or even under 100K. Um, and <laughs> even, yes, <laughs> 10K, or volunteer-led and no funding. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> so, yeah, we, that, that's our focus, really. Um, and we've been, we moved ourselves to Office 365 in 2013, and since then, we've supported 50 groups move themselves. And we'll talk a little bit more about that. Who in the room is already using Office 365? OK. So did you come to the session because you want to learn a little bit more about how you might be able to embed that, get it used, make the most out of it? OK, all right. <laughs> and then others in the room are maybe thinking about this as an option going forwards. OK. So we'll, we'll, we'll cover things I think that will be useful to both of you. Um, okay. Because as the product, the product's evolving all the time. So even if, you, even if you're using it at the moment, there's new stuff coming on board all the time. And so it's quite a good thing just to keep up to date with what's happening. Yeah, and we often talk to groups, don't just think of it as file storage and email. There is so much more, um, and we'll cover some of that. So we've got a little bit of a... Roadmap, this is kind of how we work with organisations. What's the driver? What's making you look at moving to the cloud? Um, getting people on board, and this is a key thing. Whichever cloud solution you go for is bringing people with you, um, getting them to understand the benefits early on and that there's some benefit in it for themselves. Um, it's all in the prep then, and this is where we'll give you some tips from our experience. Um, don't skip the prep bit because further on down the line you'll regret it. Kind of planning that migration, uh, risks and mitigations, then training and embedding with the, the organisation. I can't really stress that enough. There's some great resources out there for training which, which are free yeah. um, and they're, they're, it's, it's really important to do that step. And then take full advantage of the features. So again we're going to show you a little bit about lots of the other apps that people aren't really familiar with. Okay, so what's the driver? So for those of you that have moved, what, what made you take those steps? Uh, primarily email. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, and the flexibility of being able to access your email. Any other yeah, offers? Use, um, dynamics to host and CRM. Okay, okay. And so then it was being compa having that compatibility with email and yeah, so storage? Yeah, Okay, and yeah, so okay. Yeah. Um, I mean, obviously, we've thrown in a few pictures for interest, but it could be that you want to be working from anywhere out of, you know, getting it. For many of the organisations we support before this, they were very much fixed to their office and, you know, they could only access data and email. So it was um, bringing this much greater flexibility, remote working, outreach working. 
Um, so it's kind of understanding what your driver is. I'm not getting on very well. There we go. And then, as I mentioned, um, for us, it's, it's getting on groups to understand that they might be choosing Office 365 for a certain reason, but there's a whole lot of other um, apps and elements of Office 365 that they've first of all got to be aware that they're there. Um, so Sway is a little app that you can use for newsletters, presentations and reports. Forms. I ran the data capture session this morning. Lots of people are using Office 365. They don't realise there's an online form builder. Um, and this is all free as part of your subscription package. We'll talk about subscriptions a bit later. Planner. Does anybody use Trello? So um, Planner is very similar. I've used Trello in the past. I've now started because we use Office 365 to, to look at using kind of the, the in-house app. So Planner, very similarly, you can set up columns of things to do. You can collaborate with other people. A project, a kind of slim down project management mm. tool you can use it for. Um, we found that really useful. And I've used, found it useful to collaborate externally use on Planner. Teams, that's a kind of collab, I think of it as an online collaborative space where you can bring different um, apps into it. The great thing for me as well is that you can switch on in your Office 365 admin account that you can invite external people into that space that aren't, don't have your domain. So if that could be a space for trustees if trustees don't have a organizational domain where I'm collaborating with external organizations and I'm project managing a partnership project I've started to use teams invite people in and that's where we work and they only, they only have access to that yeah. one team and any files that are in there so it's quite a good way of securing the data yeah and we'll look at if we've got time we'll look at some of these in a bit more detail I've got some screenshots power bi as well a business um, intelligence tool with analytics and visualizations that you can switch that on in your um, subscription as well. And then EMS, Enterprise Mobility and Security, it's not an app, but we'll talk more about that. That's where you can um, put in different levels of access control to your data, um, email encryption. So some of these things that you might be paying for third party products, you can, um, sometimes you might need to switch them on, but they're available as part of that. So we talk very often to groups, don't just think, whoops, don't just think of this as the email and data storage solution. There, there's more to it. And as you can see, there's a lot more apps. Um, OK. Is this you, Colin? Yep. So um, I think the, the first thing to do is you've got to think about what's your current setup. Um, Look at what your current operating system is. Look at what your current hardware is. Are you on Macs? Are you on Windows? What versions are they? Um, and because it's really important, because there's a lot of features you can get if you're running, say, Windows 10, um, which you can't get if you're running Windows 7. And don't forget some of these things. They've got an expected lifespan. Windows 7's expiring in a year's time. So it's coming to end of life. So there'll be no more updates available for it. So it's a good time to think about rolling out to Windows 10 if you're on a Windows platform. Um, what version of Office are you running? If you're running 2010, if you're running a desktop version of Office, if you're running version 2010, you soon won't be able to actually use that with Office 365. Um, they're starting to push you towards Office 2016 and Office 2019, or even the Pro Plus versions of Office. So there's a few things to think about what you've currently got in your environment before you actually start looking at what are we going to do, off, what are we going to use Office 365 for? Um, one of the other key bits to think about is, is your current broadband. Um, if you're just using your data locally, you're not really using any bandwidth. If you're going to be using um, SharePoint or OneDrive for your data storage, your, your broadband is going to be critical. Because if you've got, for example, if you've just got a standard ADSL line, not fiber, then if that's it's, if the upload speed on your broadband is, say, 512, and you're saving a document, I think I've got, if you're, I'm saving a one meg document, that's going to take you about 17 to 20 seconds to save it. So people are going to get really irritated with that, and it's going to 
affect the user experience completely and people are going to hate it. So you really need to be looking at fibre as a minimum um, before you go to Office 365 for your data storage. For email, it's not too bad because you're not really using a lot of bandwidth all at the same time and it's going to be obvious to your users. Um, but for data, it's definitely critical. Make sure you've got your bandwidth up there. And we've migrated quite a few organisations, just the email for now, because either they're waiting for fibre to come into their area or um, they're waiting to have a budget to increase their mm. broadband. Um, the other thing with, to think about is, do you have a server? Um, if you do have a server, often people think, oh, we're going to go to Office 365, we can get rid of our server. And yes, you can do, but check what apps you've got. A lot of them need a server to run, or they need a local storage space. The key ones are Sage, where that's saving stuff locally, and you need to save that either on a server or on a NAS drive. Um, people forget about that. If you've got old access databases, you can't just push that up to Office 365. Access has to be written to work in Office 365. So you can't just go, oh, we're going to push it up there, and everyone can access it. Um, think about these things, and you need to document them. Um, if your environment isn't too big, it's not too, not too hard to do, you can go around and audit your computers and find out what's going on. If you've got 100 or 1,000 desktops, it's a significant piece of work to audit what's going on. Mm -hmm. um, and it's, it's all part of the planning. And think, you need to spend a lot of time preparing it and thinking about what you're doing. Don't just jump in um, and hope it's all going to work, because it probably won't. Do you want to say something about number of users for the server? Um, not particularly. User management. Oh, yeah. I mean, yeah. you know, obviously, if, if, you, if you do decide to get the server, one of the key bits is that um, um, currently if you're using roaming profiles and you've got user management and print management, you're going to lose that functionality by just turning the server off. There's some things, there's some ways you can mitigate that. Um, if you're moving to Windows 10, you can use something called Azure AD which is the functionality of the user management um, on your local server is held in the cloud in the Azure um, workspace. So that's a great reason for moving to Windows 10. Um, whereas if you're on Windows 7 or Windows 8, you can't use that functionality. So it's another reason for moving to Windows 10. So that might be where you're hot desking a bit and at the moment you've got a roaming profile through the server, so it's your desktop that you're seeing and your icons that you've saved or your and you're then logging into your Office 365. Yeah, I'm yeah. sorry if, I'm, if some of this doesn't make sense, if it's a bit too high level for people, um, but Oops. just grab us or just ask, what, what do you mean? So we're just no, going to, no, oh, we're not going to go on I'm that bit. I'm not getting on that. <laughs> um, we're just going to talk about the, um, the different levels of subscrip subscription that you've got with Office 365. Um, the main, the main ones, the, the, it break, basically breaks down into two categories. Either you've got small, small business um, tenants or subscriptions, and you've got the enterprise subscriptions. Um, for non-profits, I would say always go with enterprise plans, purely because it gives you some extra functionality, um, and it gives you more options further down the line for things to add in or to upgrade your plan to. Um, the small business plans, slightly cut down, and you're limited to 300 users. Um, so people think, oh, we've only got 10 users or 50 users. Um, we'll just go with small business. I would say just go for the enterprise plan. It gives you all the functionality of the small business, and it gives you the opportunity for moving forward uh, in the future. Um, there's a number of different levels of the plans you've got in the enterprise model. You've got the donation plan, which is the E1 plan, um, and that is basically your free plan. And that will give most groups everything they need. If you're um, a registered charity. Yes, if you're a registered charity, if you're a CIC, unfortunately, Microsoft don't allow that, don't give you that for free, and Google non-profits don't give you that for free either. Um, you have to be a CIO or a, a registered with a charity, charity commission. Yeah. Um, and it's, it's really frustrating because a lot of the smaller groups, this is what they need, but maybe it'll come, um, we just have to see. Um, but if, you're, if you do qualify, um, the E1 plan will give you most things that you need. It will give you email, it will give you SharePoint, which is your data storage, it will give you OneDrive. Um, the only thing it doesn't really give you um, is a subscription to Office, which is basically what the, the next level up, the E3 plan, 
would give you. If you're only doing it to get Office, think about the Tech Trust Office desktop license because that's 22, 24 pounds. And that'll give you a license on a machine and that might be a cheaper way to do it. Um, whereas if you pay for a, uh, a monthly subscription, it can soon add up. So it's just a think, something to think about. If you do want the E3 plan, it gives you something extra called a legal hold and additional archive storage of emails. Most groups won't really need that because you've got 50 gig of email storage anyway. And really, if you're looking at that amount of email storage, <laughs> I think you've got other issues. Um, trying to search, that would take some time. Um, one other reason people used to go with the um, E3 plan was it includes the enterprise mobility and security package as standard. Um, you can now buy that as an add-on. And so for, um, for people that got the E1 plan, if you uh, qualify as a, as a charity, you can get the uh, Enterprise Mobility and Security package for 50 licenses for free. Um, and you can just add that on to your E1 plan. And that will give you all the facilities that Kate talked about of email encryption, um, data security. It will give something called Intune, which is your mobile management. And it gives you an additional level of Azure AD or Active Directory, which is your single sign-on. Um, and I think it's a, it's a no-brainer to go for that. It's there, you just need to switch it on. So it, yeah. although it's kind of there, by de you, can, you can request to switch on the 50, it's not by default switched on for you. So that's just something people, you know, you wouldn't know. And actually mm. we stumbled across that when it was free. We, you know, we didn't see, we haven't yeah, seen we started off doing Yeah, we started off doing the trial um, yeah. of the paid for version. And then we were just about to uh, enable the, the, the paid for version. And I thought, oh, what's this? 50 free licenses. And so we thought, oh, we'd go that. And it was only, I think, about four, five, five, six months ago they actually introduced it, and it just crept in. I don't know if some of you are aware that uh, Microsoft make a donation of, or make it available for $5,000 donation to use Azure. Um, they've reduced that to $3,500, and they've filled it in with this EMS licensing. So there's, it's a, they've played around with some figures, but basically I think a lot more people are going to make use of the um, EMS licenses. And the Azure yeah. package. For some of the small groups we work with, this means that they can put that encryption on for their email, and it, you know, it's quite a, a game changer. Mm. Especially with GDPR coming in, people are a lot more concerned about email and data security. Yeah. Fortunately. It's encrypted anyway to TLS two. Um, yeah, it is. It's it, data is encrypted at rest, at both oh, on where you are and it's in transit. The, yeah. But this is this is making sure that the email goes to the person it's supposed to. Um, and that they, they are, when, for them to open it, they need to log in and put in their password or credentials to authenticate that they're the person that you sent the, the email to. If anybody is paying and sitting there thinking, actually, we, we should look into the free version, you can um, migrate a paid for subscription across into a free one. And we've got a fact sheet because we've found quite a few groups who are in that position, so actually we could add that link. Yep. It's not in here at the moment. It's a bit of a process, but it's yeah. not too bad. So you don't have to re-register and then you can... And you can mix and match um, the, the subscriptions you've got. So if you've got, say, a few users that you want to have um, the Office licenses on, um, you might have five E3 licenses or something, everybody else can have an E1 license. So it's easy to mix and match the licenses. And if you've got email addresses that don't need to have any data access or, or need to have a, a, an office license, for example, an info or an admin or a hello email account, you would just put those on a free E1 license. So you need to just remember to play around with your licensing model. Yeah. We've kind of put together a slide with the process for registration because there is a bit of an order that you need to do. Um, so I'm not going to really run through that in no. too much detail. That's there for you. Um, but yeah, the, fir the first step is make sure you register with Tech Trust, yeah. which you know you should be anyway. Um, and with then you get a validation key, and, and it's the same if you're going for the um, Google nonprofit as well. You follow the same process. You need to get a validation token, and that shows the Google or Microsoft that you are an accredited charity, an approved charity, and so it speeds that process up. Yeah. Can take a little bit of time. Can take a couple of weeks. Um, but usually it happens quicker than that. Okay. So we, we've kind of touched on a, um, 
a few things. We're just summarising really here about a phased plan of action. So the once you've kind of documented what your current infrastructure is and you've worked, you've made some decisions about actually we should, we, we might need to do some upgrading. So we would suggest that you do that first. Um, and actually it gives your users a chance to get used to a new Windows 10 if you're moving to it and a new version of Office and you're not kind of doing everything all together. So we'd recommend that you kind of do that first. Um, then look at migrating your emails and then your data. Uh, very often when we're working with organisations, there's quite a lot of prep around the data in terms mm. of restructuring, maybe archiving. So you could be getting on with the other areas and then you'll be ready at that point. Um, but also from our experience, we'd recommend that for each of those phases, you really pay attention to the engagement and the buy-in from, from your teams. Um, manage expectations and showcase the, the, the benefits. Um, so it's not something that's being done to people, but they understand that there will be benefits for them. And this it, is a tricky one. Some of our organisations, there are people that just stay in an office, so they don't get to see some of that, you know, extra flexibility that it brings in terms of being able to pick up emails from everywhere. But it's um, it's kind of looking. But it could mean that then that opens up another opportunity for that person that you, they could be doing some homeworking when that hasn't been an option exactly. before. So or with with. You know, with Snow, people can work at home, they can access their data at home, they can do it all through a browser, so they don't need anything installed on their machine, um, whether using a Mac, a Chromebook, or a, a, a Windows machine, just to, through a browser, you can log into Office 365, you can use the online versions of Word, um, so you've got, the four, you've got the suite there that you can use, so it's, a, it's really good to be able to do that. And then we've put training, 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 and, and kind of building in as the ongoing office. Sometimes we'll come into an organisation, there's been a new member of staff, and they've, there's been not, they've not really been explained. Yeah. They don't get what, you know, what is Office 365. So it's kind of really making sure you're building that in. And you, I mean, some of these, these stages you can actually pilot. So if you've got your Office 365 subscription, but you don't want anybody to go live with it, you can play around with um, emails and you can play around with Outlook just by using a, 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 the tenant account and you can put some data into a team site in SharePoint. It doesn't need to be live. You can just try it and see what you think and show people what it looks like. Um, it's just good to get that user engagement. So again, from our experience, these are the kind of things that get forgotten about and so this is why we've started to list them out. So when we're working with a group, we will run through all of this. Um, there's the piece around um, archiving. Um, you need to document, do you kind of rely on lots of different distribution lists? Um, have you got forwarding and rules? Some, some organisations use, there was one in particular that we're working with that seemed to have hundreds of things that will automatically get forwarded. So you need to kind of, if, if the expectation is that they need the, the new system to be doing that, we need to, you need to kind of get that all documented. Um, especially with forwarding, maybe even think, why are they forwarding? Why yeah. are, <laughs> We're challenging do, back. Why, do, why are you doing do, it that way? If you've got one, one email address that comes in that gets forwarded off to 10 people, do they know that that, that other person has read that email and dealt with it? So do, you could just, actually just have a shared mailbox, or you could have a, a delegating mailbox where they can all have access to it, yeah. and so they can see that that email has been answered and dealt with. Yeah, so sometimes just by going through all of this, it might you know, question, well, we, why have we always done it that way? Mm. There might be a, an actual better way. So um, resource calendars, people forget to tell us that they're using, a, it's a really key thing about booking a room. Uh, <laughs> permissions, um, there's that generic accounts, the kind of delegate access, who can see, who, who can access it, one of those shared mailboxes. Signatures. That's something that you need to kind of, you know, add in. Yeah, th these things don't necessarily get migrated across, especially yeah. if you're using an Exchange migration. So if you've already got Exchange, a local server running Exchange or a hosted server running Exchange, you can get that migrated across. But if you've just got a local Outlook account that's accessing a, a webmail, you w that information wouldn't be migrated across naturally. You'd have to do that manually. So, let me come on. It's yeah, I'm going to hand over to Colin, and we'll be a bit brief on this because I think this, this yeah. level of detail maybe. It, yeah, it's it's so. You need to think about what it, what's your current um, email platform. If you've got Exchange locally, um, that means you'd have a server locally. You can then got a few options with that, depending upon what version of Exchange you're running. Whether you can do a a big bang cutover migration, which 
you know, it, 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 it's good, but it depends how many users you're working with. It might work with, you know, a dozen users, but if you've got a thousand users, it definitely wouldn't work. Um, you might want to do a stage migration where you do them in batches, or you can do a hybrid where you you migrate them up in the background and you gradually roll them out to get people engaging with 365. So there's an options options with Exchange there, and if you've got Exchange locally, it's a real reason why people go with Office 365 because Exchange is a real resource hog, and they want to get Exchange off their boxes to free up some space. Um, if you we, we did have one client where they had Exchange hosted. We couldn't actually get the details into Exchange to get it um, to migrate across. So we had to use an IMAP migration, which is basically where all your data is held in one location, the same as if you're using webmail. And it, the, the server will talk to Office 365 and it work in the background to synchronize the emails across. So it's not like you're doing anything. It happens in the background. And then when you're ready to cut over, you can cut over. It's a lot easier to do it that way. The final solution, and it's if this is if you've this is your only option, then you'd use the PST export, which is basically where you've got Outlook, using Outlook on the desktop, and you have to export that, that data to a local file and then upload it. Problem with that is when you pull it back into Office 365, it uses a huge amount of bandwidth, because it's basically pushing up your whole emails up to Office 365 at one time. And even with fiber connection, more than about five or 10 connections at one time is really gonna knock down your bandwidth. So you, really use that only if you've got a small number of people and if it's your last resort as well. I mean, sometimes you don't have a choice. Um, then we're just talking about how people currently would be able to use Office 365 and how they'd be able to use Outlook. You've got the choice of Outlook on the desktop and you've got Outlook in the browser. Some people prefer to use Outlook in the browser. Um, recently, or currently, they've just upgraded the version of Outlook in the browser and it's much, much better than it, than it was previously. So if you are using it, and you haven't looked at it for a while, have another look because they've really improved it. And there's a few things that annoy people, like focused inboxes and conversation views that people really don't like, but you can turn all that stuff off. Um, so you get the old, old style um, emails down in one thread. Um, th there are, if you don't want to do it yourselves, obviously you can engage people to do it, but there was also, there's other organizations that you can just buy the package from, like there's a company called Sky, Skykick, and they will do the migration for you, just as a purely priced per mailbox. I think um, Tech Trust provides some support around as well if you want to do yeah. it yourself. Yeah, we've got the information desk. Yeah. I'm not sure, if, is that a paid service or a, I'm not sure. But they will be yeah, yeah. <laughs> and if maybe they've got some webinars or something, I'm not sure. To move Microsoft on? Will do it for you if you order your yeah, there's the, there's the Microsoft Fast Track service. Um, it's, it's really questionable with the, um, because we, we can order as many licenses as we like as a, as a charity, because especially if it's free. Um, generally they're doing like 50 or 150 licenses, you would get the fast track service. Sometimes it doesn't work because you're a, a, a charity, so you're not actually paying them any money. So it's a, it's a little bit tricky, um, but there's this service called fast track, and you can see it through your admin panel, um, and it's worth investigating because they're the experts and they can um, help you and assist mm -hmm. you. So don't always just try and engage someone, a third party, and pay lots of money to get it done. There's ways you can do it yourselves or even engage Microsoft to do it. Um, moving on to data. Um, one big question is, we've got our data, where are we putting it? The two main choices in Office 365 is OneDrive and SharePoint. Um, now I would, I would definitely, if you've got your, your data for your company, you're, you're definitely going to use SharePoint. OneDrive, you want to think of as more as a personal working space where um, you, like Dropbox, where you store your data, something you're working on, uh, work in practice, you don't want, to don't want to release out to the general public, don't want to make it readily available, um, or it's stuff that's purely confidential to you that you don't, you don't want to release to anybody else. Um, the way that OneDrive will work is you save a document in OneDrive and then you have to link it and share it with other people. So it's a very manual process. That's why I view it as a personal working space. SharePoint is a data storage space. It's designed as a data storage space. And in the old way that we would have uh, file shares and you put security on the file share, so that folder, say a finance folder, everybody in that finance group has permissions to it. SharePoint's the same way. You saw a document in there and everybody with those permissions can see those documents. So 
we have a few groups where they have gone to OneDrive and that's where they think is working for them. But after a while, they find they get very frustrated with it and it just doesn't work. So really think about moving to SharePoint. And SharePoint is integrated with um, the Teams app that we've shown earlier and, and which is now a core part of Office 365. Um, it's definitely, definitely worth looking at. Um, you know, with the data migration, it's a, big, it's a big task and it's something that you should definitely not um, think about lightly. It gives you a great opportunity to look at um, the data you've got. How old is it? Does the structure work for us? Um, how do we use it? How has the, the organisation evolved? What structure would work better for us? Uh, and it's a good way to recategorize your data and also even look at the permissions that you're giving out to people to limit the permissions that people have access to the data. Um, and look at where your data is, depending upon whether it's on a server, whether it's on a NAS drive, whether it's on a local PC or USB stick, where you're going to get it from. Find out where it is so you know where you're putting it up to. Um, and again, think about those folders and the permissions that you want applied to them because you can set up the groups and you can allocate permissions to them as you would do. So in terms of that data migration, sometimes what we've done is, is set up the, fo the agreed fo new folder structure in Office 365, and then groups have kind of moved the data up into those folders. Um, Otherwise, moving data is quite, is quite costly because it's quite time consuming. Um, there's a lot of third party tools that uh, will do it for you, but they can be very expensive um, from a few hundred pounds to um, 1,500 pounds just for the data migration tool to do it for you. Microsoft have released their own SharePoint migration tool, which is, which is good, it's free, and it works. I've used it a few times. Um, it's a bit of setting up beforehand, but it does work. Uh, it moves your document libraries up. Um, it's, yeah, it's a good way to do it. No. Yeah, yeah. It'll move your metadata and, and dates and stuff, but it won't move permissions. The so permissions. So when you define your um, sites and document libraries, you'll put permissions on those, and that's the that's what we applied to them. You move on. Yep. Just look. Oops. Oh, There's one thing I would say yeah. with the data. Um, there's, there's a couple of ways to, to, of using it. You can use it, through, use it through the browser and SharePoint and just navigate through the sites. But what a lot of people don't realize is you, you can actually access your SharePoint data through the Windows File Explorer um, and you can actually map drives to that data. So say you've got a, an old style M drive, which is your, your, your um, finance data. You can still do that mapping um, in SharePoint. There's a few things you need to do to get that to work. Um, but it's quite straightforward um, and it's great because that engages the users. They're familiar with going to the M drive to get that data and they can still do that. That's something that you can't do with OneDrive. Um, but so it's really good to have that in SharePoint. Um, How does that work with the first um, interdocument links like in Excel with a dog? Um, I'm not sure how it does. Do you mean if you, if you, use, the, so if you use the drive mapping, the folder mapping? Yeah. Um, I think it would just use the, um, the web dev path, so the path into SharePoint. I think that's what it would still use. Mm -hmm. So I think it would still work. Because you wouldn't necessarily use the M drive path because that's just local on your system. If you're accessing it within SharePoint itself, you wouldn't, it would know nothing about it. So it would, it, it, although you see it as the M drive, it's not really. It's, there's, there's a, it's a URL. Cause all, because all this stuff is in, um, in is online, it's basically everything is just, a, is just a URL path to it. And they used to have that limitation of 256 characters, so you needed to think about your naming conventions because you could easily run out of space. They have and increased... Flat, and a flatter kind of yeah. hierarchy than you might have had a deep one. They have increased it to 400 characters, yep. um, but you still need to be aware of your naming conventions and just don't have your, your folder of trustees meeting notes from December the 14th on a Thursday and then expect to be able to find it, because you won't. And there's also other limitations, like 5,000 items in a document library and a document list, um, and that can call, catch you out as well. Drive mapping is the same as a synchronised document? N no. <laughs> Drive mapping is like your old M drive. <coughs> yep. Synchronized is, with OneDrive, you've got this, this um, synchronization tool. 
which is um, like Dropbox, you can have a local copy of your OneDrive data, and they've increased the, um, they've updated the tool a lot, so now you can have only certain files, only certain folders synchronized to your local machine if you're running out of storage space, because these days we all like to have SSDs, which have limited space, so you can limit what, what you save locally on the machines. Okay, so I realise... Sorry. <laughs> And it depends where you are. Some of that stuff might be really useful if you're about, you know, if you're about to um, embark on the journey. Colin mentioned about the training. So there's an Office 365 training centre. Click on that slide. It will take you. Um, so there's lots of videos. I mean, you could be yeah. building in training, kind of making sure that people are, um, you know, so it doesn't have to be face-to-face -face training. You can be making sure that people are watching some videos so they kind of get the, the basics. I mean, there's office.com forward slash training is, we'll get you to that page. Okay. Um, now I've just, I'm going to whiz through these really quickly because I've, I've mentioned a few. These are just some screenshots of some of those apps that I've mentioned. So this is Sway, so you can build up blocks of content and publish, um, you know, as, as a newsletter or you can present. Um, so we played around with it and um, a bit of a learning curve, but um, it's, it's quite interesting what it can do. You can embed video content. Um, Forms, so if anybody's used a Google form, it's, it's pretty much the same. So you've got a tab with questions, you, you add new questions. Um, there is branching logic, so there, there are some more sophisticated kind of survey options in here um, than, for example, in the free survey monkey. but then equally there are some things that aren't here, so it's not perfect. But for quick online data capture, then you've got a tab. Um, where you can see the responses, click the button, and you can share this internally as well um, so that people can see. This is Planner. You're not going to be able to see that clearly, but if people are familiar with Trello, you'll see the same kind of idea. You can drag and drop. You can um, allocate people to tasks and dates so you can use it um, really collaboratively. This is Teams. Teams. So this is your online space. I've actually... You can add these tabs. So I've added in a planner um, into this team site, but you can also make video calls from here. So Skype, we've been testing is that out. Skype is now YouTube. incorporated yeah. within Teams. So Skype for Business doesn't exist really anymore. <coughs> Excuse me. It's now part of Teams. So you can do your meeting from within Teams. You can bring in files and have conversations and chat. So it is really um, a, something to have a look it's at. It's a good collaborative space. Power BI. I'm really fascinated this is something that I'm looking at so you can switch this on in your office 365 subscription you can download a desktop copy for free yeah. um, but I <coughs> believe this will have more sharing kind of internally and I think you can also publish from this don't quote me on that without upgrading but and you'd have to double check I and mean, all of these things that we've shown here are part of your office 365 yeah. plan and it's not these are not add-ons We've got a couple more minutes. This is just an example of, we've talked about EMS, Enterprise Mobility Security. So this is what it might look like if you switch this on in your email window. Yep, you get, a few, you get a couple of templates um, included with it. Yeah, there. The two uh, basic ones are just encrypt, which is basically <laughs> where you'd send an email and they need to prove that they're securely there. So that you'd, it see, is you'd see this protect in your, in your menu bar and then you'd have an option to change permissions and this is what you could do. So you can do not forward on, so you can say do not download. That's not there, that's for you, if you've got an... Well, do not forward is you can't yeah. edit, you can't print, or the people who receive it can't edit, print, or forward on yeah, uh, the email So you can at control all. your, you know, got more control on your data. You can, and you can add in additional policies yeah. um, as well, so if you want different levels of um, protection on your emails. It, does, it includes also data protection, data um, data loss prevention as well, so you can classify data so it won't get out of your company. Um, if that will happen manually, you can happen it automatically on rules if you pay a bit more for it. Um, and it also includes um, Intune, the, which is the package which does device management, so that you can control people's devices, you can really remove your data from them. Um, you can make sure they're updated, you make sure they've got protection on them. Is that where you can see where the people have logged on from? No, that's, no, that's Azure yeah. Identity yeah. Protection, <laughs> which so is another feature of EMS as well, where you can see yeah. there's been some funny activity that, that, that Kate's logged in from, we had someone went on holiday in China, we didn't tell us, they logged in. We didn't know they were going to China. Yeah, they logged in in China, we're going, this is a bit weird. Um, so we blocked their so account. So we got an alert, basically, that somebody had logged on into their account, but from, yeah. 
and that's just and, and that's just part of your your package which you is can great. also put on two or multi-factor authentication so lot you know so you can control that we're going to run through a few case studies i think we've brought up some of these examples this is where it didn't go so great but um this was an example of where there were lots of part-time staff um, lots of hot desking, no server. There were some kind of frustrations around um, accessing the accessing data. There were there's always a workaround. They were they were accessing their data through drive mapping. Sometimes that was breaking, um, and they weren't confident just to go to the website and, and access SharePoint that way. So it's sometimes we're yeah, kind of were, dealing with. They were creating users themselves without doing the, the preparation that they needed to do to get that drive mapping to work. So it was creating issues for themselves. Um, just quickly then, this one. Um, so this was a bit of a challenge. It was a ho they were moving from a hosted desktop, and Colin's mentioned this already. It was a challenge to get access to that data and the emails to do the migration. Um, they also did some work on the file structure, but because of they had the fun funding to do this in a certain period of time, it was such a shame. In the end, they just had to kind of move the data, go with it as it was. And with best intentions, you think, oh, well, I'll come back and do that later. But then you're kind of into your day to day. Um, and, and they had to do everything at once again because of that funding time frame. But I think they built in that buy in and training quite yeah. well and kind of champions within the organization. Um, and so there was an, a nice end to that story. They also did the Salesforce migration. Um, but it was really nice to hear what, you know, the, the migration to Office 365 and Salesforce together really made a big difference for that organisation. Just the process kind of challenged them culturally. Um, also kind of process, they kind of changed how they did some things as a result their, of it. Their costs reduced significantly as well yeah. without having the hosting to be paid for. And this was another, another group where um, moving to Office 365 um, enabled them to, when they expanded to, an, to a, another office, enabled them to actually uh, share data and collaborate really well. So it made that uh, move to the second office quite seamless. Um, and then they also actually changed their domain as well. So when they took on the second office, they changed their domain. Um, and that was quite a seamless move as well because they could just change their email accounts but still receive emails on the old domain as well at the same time. But when they were posting emails or replying to emails, it was coming from the new domain. And that was quite easy easy to do with Office 365, which they wouldn't have been able to do with just their standalone email package. I think this, this is the last slide. I think we've touched on quite a lot, you know, a lot of this. Um, but Office 365, gives, the... off, yeah, Office 365 gives you a lot of functionality around GDPR because you've got the discovery information where you can actually search and find people where people are being used in emails and within data. So you can actually, when you have that request for information or request for... Um, Whatever I can't the term. Right to be forgotten. Yeah. Well, we, the, well that, 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 that search, you can, you can do that search within Office 365, and there's a huge amount of um, resource behind Office 365 for GDPR compliance. Because don't forget, this Office 365 package that we get for free is a, com is a fully commercial package and has the full support of Microsoft and enterprises. Large enterprises are paying a huge amount of money for it. So we're getting a really good package with all the functionality around it. Mm -hmm. Some things you have to pay a bit extra for, but a lot of the stuff's there for free. And then just to finish on, don't forget kind of policies and guidelines because some of the security things will come down to um, your take on passwords, making sure you've got robust passwords across the organisation people understand. Um, if, you're going, if the flexibility means you're going to have homeworking, people are using bring your own devices, people are leaving, you've got to have kind of processes to make sure that you're maintaining authorised access only. Um, so it's kind of building that in as well. Okay, we're going to stop So it's been now. a bit of a, <laughs> a rush. We hope we answered the brief. Um, hopefully the slides will be useful to some people. If you're using Office 365, you might have found out a bit about some extra apps you're not using. And if you're going to go ahead with this, you might have some useful checklists. And I'll be around at the drink afterwards if people mm. want to... <laughs> so why, why was there so much in it? <laughs> All right, thank you. Thank you. Thanks. Thank you.